the cancer of relativism to infect us, so we think there are no shared universal values, and there is no freedom without those shared universals. In fact, it's something you can not value when you have it completely. You must have it not have, and then you will understand what you missed. Reverse the question, can art destroy the world? And I think it can. You can choose either to be abused or not. The political abuse is worthwhile. The safety of journalists. We hacked into the audience, and then all of a sudden 300 phones would ring, you know? Welcome, allemaal. Welcome, everybody. My name is Michiel Heidrijk. I'm at the um, Jublange Institute. And thank you all for coming. I very much look forward to tonight's um, debate with a great panel. Thank you for, for being here, all. Uh, this is the first debate in a series uh, uh, by the Bali and the Jublange Institute around data for social innovation. In, in health, we only know health. Uh, to some, the potential for data to improve health seems unlimited. It is not that long ago that one of the founders of Google, it was basically in Time magazine, promised to cure death. On the other hand, many clinicians, even the ones who see the opportunity uh, and, and the potential of using data, they challenge the value of the current big data opportunities for their clinical practice. At the same time, especially here in the West, we seem reluctant to even embrace any of these promises. We, we talk constantly about data ownership, privacy, security, for a reason, don't get me wrong, but I mean we don't even talk about the value of health and of, of data in health. Uh, at the Joop Lange Institute, we firmly believe that digital innovation offers the opportunity to improve and democratize health and healthcare around the world. We try to activate influential people like yourselves um, <clears throat> to think, to, to, to work on the status quo and to think differently. Because innovation is not just about inventing new things, but very much also about the political will to make them happen at scale for the public good. Digital technology greatly reduces transaction costs, increases transparency, and produces data that policymakers, professionals, and business leaders now lack to make the right decisions. And we see <coughs> digital technology revolutionize the, uh, daily lives, especially in countries like uh, China and Kenya, also here, but also in those countries. I know maybe everybody knows WeChat, people know M-Pesa. There are great things happening around the world. It's probably also in those countries because the need is the greatest and the momentum is there. Africa is making progress in many areas, but millions of people remain excluded from basic services like healthcare. But nine times out of 10, you can bet they have a SIM card and access to mobile phone. Even to mobile money using a simple Nokia. They are way ahead of us there. The mobile revolution is changing the social and economic fabric of that continent. And now healthcare, in our opinion, is the next digital frontier. The opportunities for better access and quality are enormous. So why shouldn't we collect more data for social innovations? rather than letting Facebook, Google, and Tencent, the mother organization of WeChat, to take over yet another market. This is not a theoretical question, eh? because wherever we live, we are already sharing all kinds of personal data with those giants uh, we speak about. So, enough said about this series, uh, and I will give the floor to our moderator, Rindert de Groot, and look forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, 
a good evening to you. Um, I must say that I do look forward to a bit of an impossible task. Because if we look at this question, privacy over quality. Now, I am sure that if I would ask you that, um, who would value their privacy? I'm sure that everybody would say that they do. Now, and if I would ask you that, who would think that quality of um, healthcare is important, I'm sure that everybody also would say that it does. Now, I would say that now going into a discussion uh, into the value of the quality of data uh, for healthcare, big data and services uh, for healthcare, and then go into this discussion, where does it end? Um, we will always have to weigh arguments and would also uh, come uh, and would also have to, dis to face the fact that there are certain risks. So I guess that uh, in this discussion that we will have until 10 o'clock this evening, we will see many opportunities. <coughs> we will also see significant risks. But we will not, I think, will uh, go into a debate pro and contra. I also have bad news for those who will uh, uh, hear all the arguments or all the opportunities. We will not be able to do that. But I have good news for, for those who look forward for a good discussion and an interesting thing. Because this is the age, as you all know, of big data, where the opportunities are endless and we will not know even what the dis where the opportunities go. We only know that they are endless and that we will see in the coming years an enormous proliferation of opportunities. I will ask a couple of questions to you and you will also be able to ask questions to the panel later. We'll introduce uh, a little bit more what we are going to discuss uh, a little bit later. But first, let me introduce the panel. And let me uh, first ask them to uh, come forward. Uh, Francois Venter, Rue Coutinho, please uh, come forward. Please sit on these first two. You will see them in the first round. They will stand. Um, uh, Dianda Feldman, please come forward. Jerome Singh, please sit there. I will ask, um, introduce some introductory questions, and then uh, we will go into the first uh, question round. But I would uh, before introducing even our guests, I uh, would like to know, who are you? But, um, would you please stand up? <coughs> Everyone, would you please stand up for a second? Um, now would all the doctors please sit down? Four, sit down. Okay. Now would all the, the students please sit down? <laughs> Ah, that's, that's, that thins it down. Now, would all the activists please sit down? Oh, there are no activists. There are no activists. Scientists, scientists. There's one, there's another one. Okay, now, um, let, let me see. What are you? I'm just an interested person. Just, <laughs> there are still only just interested persons. Have interested persons, just please, just the interested person. Please sit down. <laughs> That's quite enough. Who is just not an interest? That's interesting. What are you? I'm Mechtel van Homberg and I'm having an assignment for the Jublange Institute. <laughs> that is very good. People with the Jublange Institute, please sit down. <laughs> Sorry, I'm an innovator. An innovator, very good one. Uh, other innovators also, please sit down. Sir? I'm a manager of a big data firm in healthcare. Ah, a big data firm and, and other firms, people from the corporate sector, please sit down. We have two left, two standing. Sir? Hello, I'm a privacy council. Privacy council, I, and last but not least, sir, what is your identity? I'm a psychiatric nurse with the Amsterdam City Mental Health Crisis. Psychiatric nurse. Thank you very much. Um, and then I would like to ask who uh, your expectations of this. What, what do you come to, uh, to hear? Who would like to say that? What is your expectation of this debate? When would it be? Maybe it's, that's the correct question. When would it be successful? I go to you, madam. I think it's successful if we hear very different opinions and have a very good discussion. Fair enough. Can I ask you? Um, if we have great point of improvement for next discussion. Great points of improvement. Finally, you, sir? When they agree with me. <laughs> well, we'll have to see about that if they do. We'll see that. All right. 
Now, um, uh, as an opening question, um, I would like to ask you, um, uh, uh, François Venter, you are the Deputy Executive Director of the Reproductive Health and HIV um, Institute of the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. Um, I would like to ask you, um, is big data what you consider, or data in health? Uh, is it just useful or is it completely necessary for the development of healthcare? So thank you very much. Um, I think it's more than useful. I think it's a massive wasted opportunity for us to use very precious resources and reallocate them appropriately. And I think it probably holds, you can speak, I'm a South African doctor, we're a middle income country. The amount of money we spend on healthcare, which is 11, 12% of our GDP, and the information we extract from that usage is, uh, you know, that ratio is very, very poor. So I would say it's absolutely critical that we use large data sets to start informing how we use precious resources. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, so you are, uh, uh, your specialization is, is HIV? So I am a HIV doctor. I come from a diabetes, oncology, hypertension, transplant um, background. But for the last 15, 20 years, I've been doing almost exclusively HIV care, mm -hmm. which brings in, I think what's important about HIV is it brings in, I think for that field, issues of confidentiality and you know, issues of sharing information with uh, sexual partners, with sharing information with about sensitive groups like gay men or you know, any group of people like that. Uh, we've had to think about this a lot. Um, and increasingly, because of the expense of the drugs, thinking about resource allocation matched against the, the, this, this kind of, um, these data sets that we, th we, we often feel are not used enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Rul Coutinho, uh, welcome. An epidemiologist who uh, knows everything about viruses and about infectious diseases. Um, I uh, traveled the world, knows about lots of countries, uh, as in data you would be able to draw a comparison between uh, every region of the world, basically. But what would be the main difference uh, uh, as it comes to data for health uh, between the uh, uh, emerging economies and the let's say, the, the, the rich north as it comes to health uh, data for health? Um, w well, I, I completely agree with Francois that, that, that these data are very uh, important and very helpful. I think the main difference is the quality of the data. I mean, the, uh, how good are the data and how well can you use the data for the question that you are asking for? Mm -hmm. And that is a, a crucial issue. Um, for which I can give some examples. Uh, for example, if you, uh, if you would say, I'm interested in uh, the start of the influenza uh, uh, year in this country, you can ask general practitioners to give an idea about uh, how many patients they see with fever, very simple. Um, but at the same time, so you get an idea about there's an increase of patients with fever, very important. But at the same time, we have a system where we ask them to take uh, specimens where we type the viruses so that we know exactly what kind of virus it is. So it's very often the combination of very good data and very good information that helps you. I think in general, big data can be very helpful, but the question is how good are they and how reliable and how comparable. Mm -hmm. And that's a crucial issue. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll pass the microphone to Dianda Feldman. Um, now you are uh, uh, with the uh, Patient Association uh, of the Netherlands. But I, uh, I read that in the past you've also been involved with the Waka Waka Foundation. So you have been also involved, let's say, with all types of empowering individuals all over the world. Now, I know this is an impossible question to answer, but if you had to choose between the, let's say, the most healthy um, person in the world or the, most, or the person in the world that is most in control of his or her own, her own data, what would you choose? Well, that's an impossible question. <laughs> I already announced it. Uh, so I need to choose between uh, being very healthy or having control over your data. Uh, control over your data as such doesn't bring good health, but it enlarges the opportunity to have access to better health, to better uh, knowledge. Um, now, I, I can't answer this question. I'm sorry, uh, Rinder. Mm -hmm. I think it, it, it's about two uh, things that are really uncomparable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I wish everyone a, a, a good health, but uh, if you have not, um, uh, uh, you deserve support and you deserve uh, information. 
and uh, rights and all, all kinds of things like that. And, and maybe uh, big data can help a little increase uh, those things. What in terms of, of, of data uh, and is the main concern now on the table of the Dutch patients in the Netherlands? Uh, I think the, 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 the things we mostly uh, hear is that people are concerned about uh, privacy and uh, data security. I think these are the, the, the most uh, important uh, challenges uh, we talk about uh, these days. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Jerome Singh. Welcome. You are the head of ethics and law of Caprisa, the center of, uh, for AIDS program of research uh, uh, in South Africa. Uh, you've also been involved of a program of the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, which uh, put forward the grand challenges of, uh, uh, of health, of global healthcare. What is the grandest challenge on a global scale when it comes to the ethics of healthcare? There's Many. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to the panel. I think there's probably many, many challenges, and I think a lot will depend on how you balance risks versus benefits. And when you're dealing with this from an ethics perspective, you ask yourselves what are the potential benefits and what are the potential risks, and you weigh them up against each other, and you come with the net benefit. And I think, you know, the other important point to make from early on is that just because there's risk does not mean that you don't do it you've got to have mitigating steps to try to prevent or to try to address those risks. And if those mitigation steps are not there <coughs> and there's not good governance, then you'll find for me, you could have more harm than benefit resulting. And for me, so one of the biggest challenges, I think, is to balance harm versus potential benefit. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a very clear answer. Which, of course, we will see is in when we come with to specific uh, examples, not as easy to uh, to solve the dilemma uh, as you, you put it. But we will come to that. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Um, what we'll do as follows: we will have three discussion rounds. Um, uh, I will ask two of the two uh, out of four speakers to come forward and stand here. That doesn't mean that the others can't also contribute, and that it also doesn't mean that you can't, but that just gives a bit of a flow to the discussion. First round will be mostly on the opportunities for data for health. Um, the second will be mostly uh, to the dangers and to the risks to it. That's a very rough um, division of what we're going to deal with. Uh, and in the third round, we'll look towards the future. That's roughly what we'll do, but you will see how it goes, and uh, well, let's just sit back and enjoy. Let me first uh, invite the two doctors to come forward. Ro and Francois, please, please join me for uh, the round. Let the microphone uh, remain here. Um, so let me first uh, ask you uh, as a question for you both. Um, what would be the biggest opportunity? And you are free to talk about both the uh, emerging economies and and here in the the west or the north, put on terminology you prefer, for data for health. And we have also been talking a lot. Of, we've talked about data, big data services. We also might want to, to be talking about what we are in fact dealing with here. What is um, what opportunities we are discussing? Who would well, like to well, be the first? I, I think that the, the question is so general that it's extremely difficult to answer it because, um, and that's also the point I would like to stress, I think before you, uh, you, you can say you can use data, you have to formulate the question and you have to think about what do you want to know. I mean, for HIV, there is, and, and, and Francois can, 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 there's a lot of interest at the moment, for example, in we have data on HIV prevalence per country. And basically, these are useless data because they give uh, data about the whole country, which, of course, does not give any information on where exactly the problem is. So at the moment, now, people are collecting data, much more specific data on exactly in what area the prevalence is much higher. Uh, so that if you can, if you have this kind of more uh, specific data, you can also target your prevention to specific areas, to specific groups that we have always been doing, but always to specific, specific areas. So then you have a clear question that you want to answer from the data. And I think it's, it would be a pity to start with the simple fact that you collect data without asking yourself for what 
purpose. Mm -hmm. So thinking about for what do I want to use it is extremely important because otherwise later on you find out that you can't answer the question because you collected the wrong data or it was not specific enough. But, but can you elaborate from there for HIV prevention? Could you specify what kind of data would we need to collect uh, to help HIV um, prevention or to combat HIV? Well, I, I give the floor to Francois because he's he much better. I mean, South Africa is the country with the highest prevalence in the world, so you, I give the floor to Francois. So I think it's important with these big data sets particularly is on the one hand there's research questions and we can look for interesting associations that we can explore in more details, particularly for rare things. But for me, it's a management tool. So for instance, in South Africa, we have about 4 million people scattered across about 4,000 facilities um, um, on antiretroviral therapy, which, and successful antiretroviral therapy is a very useful tool for HIV prevention. If we control the virus in the bloodstream, people don't transmit the virus. For me to know that at Clinic X, the, the, the viral suppression rates are lower or there's some against some uh, some benchmark that they're falling below that, and then look as well at the um, human resource allocation according to that. That's a very powerful tool to say clinic X is not performing well. It also means in clinic Y, that if the viral load suppression rates are very good, it means a whole range of things. It means the drugs are getting through the the patient empowerment um, processes are, are actually happening in the clinic, they're tolerating the side effects. That means I don't have to pay attention to that clinic. So in terms of program management, it's incredibly important to have this aggregated data. Roll's right, you have to look at what data you're collecting, because if you talk to researchers that want to collect 50,000 things, you need to be very careful about what you do and then collect it very, very well. The nice thing about laboratory data is that it's, it's usually collected relatively um, consistently and, and the quality, as long as your quality assurance programs are good, uh, is pretty good. Yeah, can I give another example, where, where, which is well known for our country, for example, is the vaccination coverage in a certain country, which is a very good example of where you could use these data for targeted intervention. For example, you know that in a certain area or a certain group, the, the prevalence of or, or the vaccination coverage is much lower, and then you can predict that there will be a problem in that group, and that's where you can want to target your intervention. So uh, I think, yes, data, big data data are extremely useful, but think carefully about what you want to do with it and what you want to collect. But would it help to know who would speak out against vaccination on Facebook, for example? No, I mean, to, to that's useless data. information. Okay. That's useless information because people say a lot of things, but that's not what they do. So that's useless. Would it help to know who is gay? By c combining data on, on internet? social media? I mean, I'm, I'm looking to what kind of sensitive data, kind of well, data... Sec sexual you... behavior data, people will, I mean, the people who will come, come, who will come forward and say on, on the internet they are gays, it's a very specific small group, so you would, I mean, that would be biased information. So that, that is very difficult. Are you and asking, perhaps, if we knew that in Holland 500 people, these 500 people are gay, would we have an HIV prevention um, intervention that we might direct to the doctors who are looking after them? Yes, I think that might be useful. Um, it would have to be dealt with very carefully, and I think the confidentiality issues and whoever has oversight of that would have to be dealt with very, very carefully. But if you forget about all the oversight for now and just see, just look at what is the maximum kind of, you know, sensitive information about people's behavior when you talk about HIV, sexual behavior, risky behavior, opinions about sexual behavior, etc. Would that be helpful to know everything, to put it all in the system? But, but data on sexual behavior are inherently un, uh, unreliable. I mean, there are, I mean, there, it's, it's a huge number of studies have shown all men uh, sub, uh, re report heterosexual men report more day, more partners, and women always report less partners. That's the general rule, and I know it's a generalization, but it's it's it's. it's we from might a, ask the audience. No, no, no. It, I think <laughs> it, it's it's very. I mean, if you ask these kinds of sensitive data, you get an unreliable answer. So that's a typical example of collecting data where you cannot do a lot of. Where you can't do very much with it because you have no idea what you read, what the value of the of the data is. And as long as you don't have that, it's very difficult to interpret. Well, a question. What do you, what is your definition of big data? That's a good one. 
Well, my, my definition is that it is a, is, is a very, very large group of people where you have uh, data on, well, it depends on what kind of data. It can be samples, can be data on, on, on people, but there's no, as far as I know, there's no real definition on the numbers. From different sources. Yeah, from Sometimes from different, from different sources, sources yeah. but That's for for example, if you have sample collections for, let's say, genetics, uh, you have uh, information on the samples, and you have samples from hospitals that are that are an example, and you have a limited information of the people. But the combination, of course, is always best. If you have laboratory data without background information, that's useless. Uh, and if you have only epidemiological data without biological information, as a biologist, a person who's trained in biology, I'm always very hesitant to accept that. All right, so, we have an interruption. One, one second, sir. So, I have a, okay. one interruption from, yeah. Yeah, I, I was uh, wondering if we can make a difference between structured data, which I hear Rule talking about um, a lot, versus yes. unstructured data. Yes. Structure versus unstructured. Well, yes. Big yes. data is usually understood as mostly unstructured data, as I understand. Okay. So, Very short, please. What I call curated data, people that has a, clearly an author that knows uh, what he's documenting. In, in other words, can you use in healthcare non-curated, unstructured data in large quantities at all? Can you? Well, Example? Yeah, great. Um, let's see, on um, uh, ge uh, geographical data, uh, you could actually see where people are at Friday night. There are certain areas where at Friday night if people are there, it's very likely that they will uh, be in, let's say, uh, unsafe sexual behavior, which um, uh, might, uh, uh, which is unstructured data, but it could help you in finding those target groups that you want to, want to find. But, but if, if there is a demonstration, that doesn't mean that there is a, there's a lot of people there, but they don't have sex together. That's why it's unstructured data. You don't, you're not sure. Depends. You're not, you're not sure. It's not like uh, a fact of, uh, it's not a fact that those people behave uh, uh, unsafe. However, there's a big opportunity, a big, big, uh, big possibility that they behave unsafe. I think that's the whole uh, thing about uh, this uh, big data. You're not sure, you're just seeking patterns. Clear. Alexander? I was thinking on what Dr. Coutinho said about uh, genetics. So genetics is also related, I think, to ethnicity, right, in many cases. So. It wouldn't it be well, it's more used for for personal medicine. I mean, the idea is behind it that also, you're not if there's an outbreak or if some something new is discovered in a certain gene that a certain ethnic group might have. You would want to try to find those people, and you could use Facebook for that. The Armenians in Holland, or I don't know, or whatever club there could be. Uh, would it be useful to know? I mean, we don't know who has which ethnicity in Holland, right? It would be good to know, or not, as a doctor. Yeah, I mean that's a good example. I mean, as you probably know, in the U.S., it's it's being uh, it's it's not a problem that people are ethnicity is is something that is uh, norm, all pr people give their own ethnicity and then they say that is your ethnicity. Here in the Netherlands, it is not being recorded. The general practitioner does not have information about ethnicity, which. You can, which we understand because of the background, and we recently we had a, uh, which we discussed, we had a, a discussion on hepatitis C, which is a disease which is mostly happening among either injecting drug users or from migrants coming from certain countries, and we want to 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 find the people that are uh, that ha are at higher risk, so we could ask the medical doctors, general practitioners, to simply identify uh, people coming from some uh, certain endemic countries, and they can't do it because they don't have that information. So that would be helpful, but there are a lot of reasons why people, uh, why it's not uh, being uh, uh, recorded. It's, it's being said that it is recorded. Excuse me, I'll come with the microphone. And in our medical uh, history, when people arrive for the first time, we always ask their name, where they were born, and. I think most of us do that, but we don't use it. That's another thing. But do you do you record it in your system? Yes, we do. Ah, I, that's interesting. Yes. <laughs> because I had a lot of discussion with general practitioners that say they are not allowed to but, do but, it. But, but well, anyway, the fact that it's happened. Give the floor to, uh, to Francois. A question to Francois. Sir, 
Uh, you mentioned that the data and statistics was for you interesting that you could localize and analyze which clinics are perhaps performing or underperforming. I'm curious, who analyzes the statistics? Well, there may well be other factors involved, such as socio-economic or environmental factors, which could um, either exacerbate or uh, actually devalue the treatment being given by that clinic. And secondly, just as in the British model with the United Kingdom, once they start identifying clinics who are performing better or performing less well in terms of uh, achieved rates of uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, league tables is the term they use. Then you get into very dangerous waters because then some hospitals will get less funding, their results will go down more, they right. become more deprived. So I'm very concerned that the data collection will not just be used to say, oh, well, we have to put resources there, but in absolutely. But that's all about data collection on, on clinics, right? Social, social, much couple. What, what's your, what's your point? Are you against this, or? I'm suspicious about uh, 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 who will be the end user of a lot of this material. No, I think that's right. probably. I, I think you. that you raise actually. Probably what everyone's slight disconcerting around this thing is who's going to use this and for it to end. You know, for me the. The ability to um, look, I, I, just to give you an example, just of how we, it also overturns conventional wisdom. So in the HIV world, we were always told, you know, as the, the program has got busier, as we expand pr uh, coverage, um, the bigger clinics, would, f the adherence would fall over. That bigger clinics, the, you know, the attention to detail, there would be less counselors, there would be busier clinics, that the patient's the adherence would just would fall over. In the smaller clinics where people have got more time, that they would be able to um, you know, spend more time with their patients. We saw exactly the opposite. In, patient, in the small rural clinics where there were like sometimes 30 or 40 patients, adherence to the viral suppression rates were 40, 50 percent. In the very, very busy clinics where I work, some of, the, some of them are the busiest clinics in the world, and we had 90, 95 percent. So what was happening in those clinics anthropologically was really interesting is that the patients were starting to form support groups in the bigger clinics, while when there's only 30 in a rural clinic, there just wasn't enough, in, uh, it was enough there. So for us as program planners, is to start overturning this decentralization program actually might have done some harm and trying to, to, to think about what that might mean. But you're right, we, I'd like to think we're relatively trying to do the right thing around that. At the, the fate of what we had, do see sometimes, particularly in the rural areas in South Africa, you know, you live so far away from a clinic, you're very lucky to have one near you. So to have a choice between two is, but in the urban areas, we have seen that, is people will move from one clinic to the other based on their perceptions of whether it's best or not. I'm not sure in our situation we would take league tables particularly seriously. We'd probably take more seriously whether our uncle was treated well the last time in a particular hospital. But I think that your, your question is well taken, or your comment is well taken. Would, if I would summarize this, or if I would draw a line here, is, uh, would data or, well, services based on, on data, as the gentleman here refers to, uh, would be equally powerful uh, to empower patients both here and in Africa, for example? Would that be a fair statement? I, I think so, but, but again, I think uh, you have to define for what use you, what, what do you want to use it for? I mean, if you have quality data and you can use it to, to improve the quality of the care, it's very helpful and very important. Then you can say, well, it's a difficulty for the hospital or, or the clinic, but basically it's not for the clinic that we're doing it, it's for the quality of the patient care. So, uh, what's, I mean, that, that's, that's a very clear uh, goal and an important goal, and you have a lot of goals like that in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So from our side, we, we're, I'm sure it's really big data, it's more this technologically automated data is to say, can we push data to cell phone technology in particular? So we have a blood result that pertains to your disease, can I push that result to your phone? You pick it up and do something with that information, obviously attached to, you know, if, if your result is X, you must do Y, and if it's Y, you must do Z. Um, quite prescriptive information, trying to empower patients like that. So I think there is quite a lot of usefulness to that. There's a lot of issues around confidentiality and there are lots of issues around, particularly around Africa where we, you know, people use lots of different cell phones and they share cell phones, but there are ways past that. And I think it's a very exciting time to think about, can we put information into patient hands to actually make personalized decisions about their healthcare? That then, I mean, we were talking about discussing, you know, the fact that actually having a discussion with your healthcare worker rather than being told, part of that is actually being able to think about the information before you get into that interview with your healthcare worker and having the time to think about the questions you need to ask. 
sir? Yeah, I think we're we're missing the big opportunity here. Um, I think for each treatment that we give a patient, uh, future patients should benefit from all the experience we give to the uh, to this patient. So. Mm -hmm. I think the next generation of patients should have more benefit from any treatment to, given to any patient in the world that that specific patient will get. So it's not about uh, uh, improving, the, the, it, it's, it's also about the, uh, improving the care for individual patients, which would be very important, you know, and their privacy issues are very important. But for future patients, all the rough data, all the unstructured data about the whole treatment where uh, some patient like my daughter, she was when she was born, she had files this big about the treatment of her disease. And it was all on paper and no future patient benefited from all that information. And currently we store all that information in IT systems. And my true belief is that future patients can benefit massively from all this unstructured data. And so we don't know why we're collecting it, but we know that uh, there's no specific goal, but generally using all this information mm -hmm. and being able to, to browse through it, like Google is able to browse through through, through all, all my information. So I think in general, I, I, I agree. Sorry, I think in general you agree, but the point is you say unstructured data. And for example, look at cancer treatment. I mean, you need to have very specific information on the kind of disease, the kind of treatment, etc. And if that is not collected in a very careful and standardized way, you can't use the data. Is that true? Do you, do you agree? Is that true? Do you have to now, uh, uh, Francois, would you agree, uh, collect it in a structured way already? Or can you just dump it and, and, and analyze it later? I think, the, I mean, I'm not a big data expert. My sense is that you can actually discern quite useful data from, from unstructured data. I mean, I, one, I maybe just to throw out the controversial ones, which I think have got real, uh, there's uh, the supermarket chain Target in America has these massive data sets where they've been able to work out what women buy from Target if, and then they realize they're pregnant later. So they can actually, what they've done is focus their advertising to future generations of customers where they can actually target diapers and things before that woman knows she's pregnant. How, now from a public health perspective, I actually think that's really interesting because it suggests to me that we can intervene in other behaviors in a medical condition where actually finding something out early is actually useful. I feel a bit creeped out personally that a supermarket chain actually gets that information before my healthcare provider. So I do think these things are interesting, this, the, these kind of analyses and things. They, they, they are looking for behavior. That's, that's Sorry, I, I come with the, with the mic. That, that's, that's looking for behavior and it's interesting, but it has nothing to do with health data. Right, so that, why, that, that why, is a okay. valid but Can, can valid I disagree point? with you? Is why not? Any, any IT perspective on this? Uh, sir? Uh, in the past, you would have to structure your data beforehand, but now, and like what Google is doing, they use MapReduce. Yeah. It's a two-step process where first you, you go through all the websites in the world and you, you map it onto something that you want to count, and in, in the reduce phase, you, you turn it into useful numbers. So it's a thing of the past. Right, so, so please please wait before you get the microphone. I will go to uh, this center. But on studies like Generation uh, R in Rotterdam, for example, um, those type of studies where they're not actually knowing what they're looking for, but they're just collecting lots of data. Um, that's quite similar to supermarket stuff. We, afterwards, we know that the patients well, know, developed cancer, but we can um, look at the data before they had cancer and perhaps predict them that they get cancer. It's sort of similar. But, but can you explain me, give me an example of what, what you're going to use it for? Because I had this discussion, for example, on influenza, which is very interesting. There was a guy who, who set up a system through internet and he said, I'm much faster able to predict what's going to happen and where the, and when your influenza epidemic has started. And we compared it with our surveillance system and it was absolutely not true. I mean, his unstructured data didn't give any specific information better than the information that we had already. It was, it was useless data because it was, not, it was not specific enough to give information about what we wanted to know. And he asked a lot of money for that and we said no because it doesn't help. So what is the, so what is the example there? Well, I'm not familiar with all the specific examples, but I can imagine that you can find new biomarkers or sort of new indications of diseases in the future that we're not aware of now yet. All right. I'm, I'm going to the... Hi. Well, this is an exception. I normally don't give out the microphone. Go ahead. Hi. I was wondering, things like Grindr or Tinder, which would be very useful to map sexual networks, 
Um, what kind? Sorry, say it again. So dating apps. Uh, which can be, <laughs> which can, can be somebody really, give a little really, demonstration really useful to, uh, <laughs> which can be super useful to map sexual networks, uh, which, for example, with HIV prevention, could be very useful to research or to look into. Uh, if you get more information about those dating apps, you can see whether people have preferences about using condoms uh, whilst having sex. Do you think that it is? <laughs> do you think that um, that is useful data? Would you be willing to work with it? Given I don't know, Grinder calls you and they're like, we're willing to share our information. Do you think it's ethical, or do you think that that is something that would be useful for you to use okay. compared to maybe more old-fashioned ways of mapping sexual networks? Uh, and I think there's other examples, but this is. So maybe you've asked um, Grinder. Interestingly enough, there have been several HIV self-testing initiatives actually through Grinder. I think they've been overtures to Tinder because you can imagine that just the sexual networking days would be so interesting to look at um, through that. But as far as I understand, the company has been a little bit uh, less cooperative. Paradoxically, Grinder is apparently been much more useful. <laughs> Is everybody else familiar with these uh, networks? No. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, but, but, but the only thing is, if, you are, if you're making an appointment with, with someone, it's very important and so, uh, I mean, it gives you information. But what you really want to know is what happened during that contact, Correct. you see? Because it is useless information, again, if you know that you met each other and sit together and whatever it is. But if you don't know what kind of sexual contact was it, et cetera, et cetera, that's, that's what you need. And that's exactly the problem with this kind of data. Then you, you, may, be, you may interpret it completely wrong. And network data are very, very useful. I mean, there are a lot of information about, about networks that are extremely useful. But again, you have to know exactly what's happening. Uh, uh, excuse me, um, I'm, excuse, I don't know where you are, but I will get to you later. I will get, we're, we're in this corner now. So, rule, rule, excuse me, but this is for discussion's sake. I think this is typically a doctor's problem. Really? Yes. Why? Because, no, is because, sexual behavior is a doctor's problem? No, no yeah, that's certainly also. <laughs> no, no, I think it's everyone's problem. It depends on the sexual behavior. Okay, ah, I, just, yeah. I distract myself on the point I try to make, is that, so, yes, if it is very invasive, so if you want to use it for clinical data, then of course it needs to be at a certain level of uh, that the data is really correct. But for behavior, which I think is also very important for, for health, and who cares about some, some, some um, uh, false positives? It is, we never look at the alternative. So mm. now we have absolutely no idea <laughs> what happens, basically, and through Grinder we potentially have an, an, a 70% idea. Mm. But to me, that is a 69% gain. Uh, and yes, it is not significant. Who, yeah, but okay, who cares? I mean, it's not really invasive. So we can pinpoint policy much more closely. And so, what policy? Now, yeah, so if, for, I, I have a real example. In Amsterdam, we know the incidence of, of, of HIV. We know it per year. There, there is, at the moment, absolutely no policy at all which differentiates to the pockets that we see in the city. Testing is done completely <coughs> ran randomly. So, and in that case, I don't believe this is the perfect answer, but I would definitely go for a differentiated approach. And, and uh, yeah, it doesn't really hurt doing it. A, a differentiated approach. Final reaction of the, for this round of you both. I'm probably less um, cynical than Roel, but because I, th I think with many of the sexual behaviours things, I don't know if you've seen this book, A Billion Wicked Thoughts, which looked at porn purchases um, amongst um, uh, credit card holders, how, they, how on earth they got access to this information, I don't know, but, but showed a completely different spectrum of people's like sexual interest to what was actually put forward. And I think from that, it starts overturning a lot of the conventional wisdom around, particularly around sexual behaviors. It starts at least asking more insightful research questions. So I think that, you know, we've, particularly in my environment, we have been so unsuccessful in, in HIV prevention. You know, treatment we've nailed, it's going really well, but the prevention stuff, and part of that I think is partly because we haven't understood um, sexual networks and, and the true behaviors around them. As Roald's correct to say is, people 
people lie, you know, face to face. This, there might be alternatives. Even if it's not perfect data, at least we can get a better sense of what people are up right. to. Um, yeah. And Grinder, the Tinders, the porn purchase, yeah. who knows what, might give us a better indication of that data. But maybe I can add, because otherwise my, my approach is too negative. I think the idea is that you can use the data if you combine it with other data sources. So if you have a lot of different sources, usually the data become much better. So if you have this kind of information and you do additional studies and you have information, then you can use it in a much better way. So we'll just do it all. That, that, that's, I think, the answer. All right. Thank you very much. That's the end of round one. Please be seated. An applause for the doctors. May I invite uh, Deanda Feldman and Jerome Singh to come forward? And um, we're now going to round two with the first question to address to both of you. Who should own all this data? And I can guess some of the, some, when I put this question to Deanda, I can basically guess a bit of the answer, but let her, let her start with this. Who should own the data? I, I think you can't own data. It's a matter of having access. And of course, uh, we find patients should have access to their own uh, data. It's a very important uh, point. And we're also working on this very actively in the Netherlands, uh, preparing an, uh, a, 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 a situation where, uh, where, where patients, people, can uh, have, well, actually have their medical data in the palm of their hand data from different hospitals, from the general practitioner, from the dentist, uh, uh, about the vaccinations, uh, etc. But that's not about ownership, but about having access. Mm -hmm. Do you agree that you can't, that nobody can own the data? I so think there's a difference between ownership, possession, and custodianship. So you'll find that you've got to ask yourself, you may be a possessor of data, but you may not necessarily own that data. You may be a custodian of that data, but that gives you no rights to control or to manage the data. You're just merely the custodian. So I think I concur that it depends on who wants access to the data and what, to what purpose and to what end. So if there's, there's very different goals from an ethics perspective. If you want that information for commercialization purposes, then you'll find it's a very different outcome. If you want for public health purposes, it's a different outcome. So you'll find that there's no rule that information is sacred and data is sacred, nobody else should have access to that. So you'll find from a public health perspective, if you're in a setting and somebody walks into the clinic and the person has Ebola, that information has to be shared with authorities so that it doesn't wipe out half the city or half the country. So you'll find in that situation, the data may need to be shared and different parties may be need to be given access to the data or that information needs to be shared with people. So you'll find that there's no one rule. I think it depends on the context. If it's commercial purposes, is it for individual patient purposes, clinical care? Is it for public health purposes? Is it for research purposes? And there's different configurations of that. Uh, just for clarification purposes, what uh, of the three roles you mentioned is Facebook now of all the post posts about my daily life that I put on it now? So, and I think another important thing just to mention, because we're talking about data, is where is the information held? Mm -hmm. And so you'll find that information is held typically when you're looking at electronic communications in a server somewhere. And so you'll find that a lot of issues and that, you know, that the ethics and the legal field are looking at right now is jurisdictional purposes, because there's one point of who should be given access to the data, but if something goes wrong, you also have to look at what are your redress opportunities. So in other words, if something goes wrong, if there's a misuse of the data, a violation, or uh, a misapplication of the data, how does somebody get justice in that situation? So you find that with Facebook, as an example, you'll find that they can't take somebody's data from the European Union and commercially exploit that in the United States, for example. There's very different and clear rules about where jurisdiction <coughs> applies. So you'll find that I think an important issue when you're looking at electronic data is jurisdiction and governance, because governance is where you get your protection. So it's not possession of data, ownership of data is bad in itself, but it's how good is it governed and what are the implications if there's misuse or misapplication of that. 
All right. Um, maybe to, um, to keep it simple for a second, it will get complicated later, I believe. But uh, let's uh, take one example to where is, uh, on a personal level, is, uh, is made a registration of somebody's HIV status. Uh, on the personal level, that links a name with uh, uh, an HIV status. Uh, and we have both uh, the example of in the Netherlands and of South Africa, to make it, to make it easy. Um, which party could have access, in your view, to that information, to start with? So maybe I'll make it a bit more complicated, but more complicated okay. in the real world sense, because I'll use the example of Kenya and the example of the Netherlands, or even That's Kenya and South Africa. We have very good protections in South Africa, and in the Netherlands you've got European Union protections as well, in addition to national laws. In Kenya there may be less protection. So I'll use an example of what happened a couple of years ago, which caused great concern in the research world. But in a country like Kenya and several others in Africa, homosexuality is an unlawful practice. And so what ended up happening was there were a number of NGOs and entities that were conducting research on MSM, or men who have sex with men populations. And the data was kept in computer databases, there were records, written records, and kept in filed and locked cabinets. And then there were police raids. And the police raids were aimed at identifying these individuals because it was criminalized behavior. So you'll find there that's a clear example of where information that's stored apparently for benevolent purposes can in fact be misused and not by third parties but by state actors and when the state is the one that's creating laws you'll find that it puts the patient or patient advocates in a very difficult position because they're supposed to be the guardians of society but depending on what the local morals or laws of a, of a particular context are, you're going to find that the guardians are not necessarily going to be in the, guarding the best interests of the majority of people. Or they may, in fact, be in the best interests of some sectors of society. So that's an example of where you'll find a very different outcome from a very similar set of circumstances will happen in the Netherlands, where that's something like that is unlikely to happen, versus in a country like Kenya or Uganda or several other countries where if your information is found, you can actually be put to death or jailed just by information that is obtained lawfully or unlawfully. Because if you remember, I think the other important point to mention is that uh, when you're looking at the field of law, you need to, just say for the audience purposes, you need to distinguish between law, human rights, and ethics. They're very different fields. And so you find in some places you have laws that, in other words, it's lawful for the state authority or for private actors to do something, because the law enables them to do that. Mm -hmm. So they may be search and seizure things, right. or there may be no laws against violating or breaking into a database. So the laws, they are vacuant, and then you find that you have human rights. And the problem is that while you have human rights frameworks, in most countries around the world, human rights is not respected. And human rights prescribe minimum norms and minimum protections, not maximum. Ethics pushes for and says we want maximum. So, you know, those are some of the challenges as well, I think. If, if we put this to, to the Netherlands, is this, um, uh, does this resound with your practice? Does this, is this comparable to your uh, uh, experience? Well, I'm not an expert in ethics and, and, and law, so th I find it difficultly, uh, difficult to, to respond to. But what, what, what we see in the Netherlands is that, uh, or I think in, actually in general, that it's uh, useful to make a difference between individual data uh, and uh, uh, data that are being used for societal reasons, like uh, um, Mr. Uh, Big Data Stephen uh, uh, <laughs> referred uh, to, to help other patients or to help society or to prevent certain uh, things. I think from an in individual uh, level, it's very important that, uh, uh, that people, the patient, the citizen, uh, can decide uh, who can see your data. Like uh, when you have an HIV status, um, I don't know if this is a good example, do you want your dentist to know? They all wear gloves these days. Um, um, but maybe you want your general pr practitioner to know or, uh, or the physician in the hospital. So uh, uh, what would be important is that uh, an individual person can decide who can see my data, my medical uh, data. On the other hand, when you use your data for, for when you 
give your data for, for example, research, uh, it's very important that you're, you cannot be recognized so that your uh, personal uh, data are uh, separated from your medical uh, data. And I think one of the dangers in, in big data is that uh, many data sets can be combined uh, where uh, someone who seems to be anonymous uh, 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 is so specific because of this combination of data that suddenly there's only one person in the world uh, uh, who applies to that combination. So that's, that's a risk in big data. Right. But if we have this discussion about ethics, in the end, uh, maybe even the discussion on the discussion is important. Where, if, if this discussion is a discussion on a maximum protection, as, as you say, Jerome, um, then who decides in the end, you know, the, the discussion on ethics itself? Who decides, who has the right to decide if the patient has a right to decide if the dentist knows about their HIV status? I think Jerome? probably, uh, you know, another element to maybe bring into this is when you're looking at governance, both from an ethics or legal perspective, you would ask yourself which authority is going to have, in a sense, jurisdiction to oversee the matter, which is more or less what you're looking at. You'll find that with industry, industry likes to be self-regulated because they want to formulate the rules and the sanctions if they do something wrong. You've got state The medical profession, you mean? Yes, well, it could be the medical profession. It could be something like internet <coughs> service providers, mm -hmm. as an example. They'd like to be self-regulated. Health insurance companies like to be self-regulated. They have a code of practice that's an industry norm. Then you, so I think you, know, you need to look at whether it's the state, in other words, the Department of Health, or the Department of whatever. And I think even within the government sector, I think when you're looking at big data, it straddles several different parts of government and I think you know the audience must maybe think about this as well because we talk about this as a health issue but you'll find that depending on where or what the issue is it may in fact fall under different realms of government so it's a health issue if it falls under electronic communications and transactions it's an industry issue you'll find that if it's for example something like export of data or sharing of data becomes a privacy issue and a human rights issue. So I think there are different departments within government. And then you also have ombudsman. Should you have a health ombudsman who's sponsored by the state but independent of the state, they can hold the state accountable. Should this be a human rights uh, mechanism? Should it be a privacy ombudsman which some countries have set up like Canada and Australia? So I think it depends on who exactly should be the, it should be it, from an ethics perspective, we would say it should be an independent party and they should in fact have teeth to hold people accountable if something goes wrong so that there's a disincentive to misusing information. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question about um, ownership of data and about uh, an individual patient should know his or her data and should be able to share data with who he or she chooses to share with. I mean. Uh, the, the current technology is going, so I'm a scientist, the current technology is going very fast. Um, it is possible in the next couple of years that for every newborn baby, we have the entire genetic code on a disk for 10 US dollars, or maybe one US dollar. We're moving into that direction. We could predict 1,837 different diseases that that person will get at a certain stage in his life. Statistically, it's not sure, but hey, you can give those chances. My question is, how much information uh, can a, a, an individual cope with before getting sick of the information? <laughs> yeah. uh, and so how, how far should, and, and also the information asymmetry, a doctor knows what it means. A patient often doesn't know what it means if you have a certain mutation. So, and we have plenty of examples where, where individual patients, in fact, get nervous and get, get, uh, uh, get uh, yeah, it, it's really, it's bad for them if, uh, instead of good for them to have all this information. So are there limits to the information that people can cope with? And probably per person this is different also. When, when do we have um, information overload as a patient? Well, well, a, a couple of our members just issued a, a brochure about uh, how to deal with, with a DNA tests, for example. When you have, um, uh, 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 I, I don't know the English word, uh, uh, a disease in your family. Hmm? Genetic disease, yes. Um, and uh, what they say, it's also about the right not to know. So, uh, in, uh, to this respect, it's very important uh, to work on uh, awareness. 
uh, um, that people decide uh, know what 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 it is. Uh, uh, think uh, what are my values? Do I uh, what, what will happen when uh, my risk on on getting uh, this disease is seventy five percent? Uh, and 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 then think think about it thoroughly and then make a decision. So awareness, being uh, well informed, is very uh, important to uh, to get a, a better balance. And uh, uh, shared decision making is something that is very important uh, because when you have well informed patients, uh, the the decision uh, on which treatment to take or not to take uh, uh, is far better and the adherence on a treatment is also uh, much higher. Mm -hmm. My follow-up question to that is, would it be then bad or good if an insurance company knows this information about you? In other words, there's a universal fear that people say, oh, if the insurance knows about this or that, or then, then I might, uh, that the information might get with my next employer and I might not get a job and all that stuff. Huh? That's coming up. On the other hand, it would also be very good if an insurance knows that you might get disease X or Y and then adapt premiums to it or adapt even preventive care to it. And it could also be very good for you. I hear no on that side. Would it, wouldn't it be good for the insurance company just, to know? I just please, had a, please, a, a discussion with one of the big uh, health insurance companies in the Netherlands. They want to work on prevention. They developed a, a nice uh, 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 health app where they support their customers uh, to live healthy and they can collect points to go to the movies or something like uh, that. And one of the, the, the things we brought up is, uh, uh, what about the data? Wouldn't it be better to store the data at a, at a third independent uh, party? I mean, it's okay as a health insurance company, in my view, that you support people who want to live healthier or support people with a chronic condition to improve the quality of their life. Uh, but uh, be aware of, of the data because people won't, many people won't give the data to you when they are not sure what you do with it. Do, do you have a point of view on that? I, I think it all boils down to disclosure and I think it all boils down to giving consent where it's applicable. And so you'll find that we had a discussion over dinner very briefly, but it's, and you, most of you maybe are based permanently in the Netherlands, so you probably won't appreciate the difference, but Franz and I were just discussing how when we checked in today, well, when I checked into the hotel, I got, I had, relatively speaking, I have a new laptop, but it was very interesting. I activated the laptop in South Africa. I've been using it for a few days. As soon as I switched on the laptop in the Netherlands, I think it was largely because of the Google lawsuits and the antitrust action, immediately as soon as I clicked on Google Chrome, I got a privacy notification asking me to select what my privacy settings were, which I think is fantastic because it's not, I think probably you don't understand or appreciate the benefits of having that, but you were given a choice to choose whether you want to target advertising, nothing at all, and so I went through all these different things. So I think, you know, uh, it was an example of good disclosure and where it was only done because they were required to do it by regulators, not because they did it voluntarily. They would have very happily for commercial exploitation purposes have kept on keeping people in the dark about how is it that you are doing a search today for a hotel in Paris so and then the next day you're getting targeted to advertising. To keep the, the corporate sector sharp on the leash by regulation. Yes, okay. completely. So, about uh, ownership. Um, who owns a zero or a one? Nobody. So ownership of, of data is, is nonsense. Uh, what, what, what is important to know who you can sue, who is accountable. <laughs> And, uh, and from that, uh, patients, yes, they have, by law, the right to see, to change, and to remove data in the Netherlands and many European countries. Um, but it starts with who owns it, who you sue when something goes wrong. It, it's not necessarily about who owns it, because remember, you have photographs that are hacked from somebody's camera the person who's the hacker doesn't own the photographs, but they've misused it. So ownership is not necessarily the important element here. The element here is harm. So you'll find that in law, you cannot sue somebody unless you can show that you've been harmed or wronged in some way. If you cannot show cause, you can't sue. So have you been harmed or whatever in your, and remember there's also in ethics and in law, there's a difference between harm and wrong. Just because you have not been harmed, doesn't mean that you don't have a right and that you have not been violated. And it, uh, uh, maybe a very easy example is where you pass by a bathroom and you peep through the window or peep through the hole 
and look at somebody naked. They don't know that they've been looked at naked. You haven't harmed them, but you've wronged them. So you'll find that in law and in ethics as well, you have a right and an action against somebody if they've been wronged or harmed. So you'll find that ownership or possession in itself is not a problem if nobody knows about it, but if they do know about it, they've got to show cause and good reason for why they were harmed or wronged. And if somebody has unauthorized access to something or has gained unauthorized access to information or data, it's a wrong and a harm. I will go to the next question from the audience. Um, what worries me is I haven't heard a lot yet about privacy and how to keep privacy. And I hear that everything is very well organized in the Netherlands and in Europe, etc. But I have some doubts. We have here the LSP, which is a way that every patient can register and then hospitals can look at all their details and they can look for it themselves. I don't trust it very much. I don't advise my patients to enter it, and none of them will, but we are rather forced by the local administration or the higher administration to do so because they want us to do that. None of my patients want it. There's a lot of mistakes in it. There's a lot of possibilities to get into all this data, and I don't trust it. I don't trust it with banks. Every year you see 100,000 items in the street. The police, it's a disaster. So why? So, 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 pri so privacy, maybe uh, Dianda first. Privacy is not safe with the current institutions in the Netherlands, with some examples. Would you agree with the, the, the This, this is audience? something, um, a small group of doctors is coming up every time. Now we have, um, we have the possibility to uh, exchange medical data, give patients more access to data. Some doctors say, I don't want to share it. So this is... Yeah. It's, it's not giving the patient uh, access to data, is it is said. Some clarification? It's giving the data to the whole country, etc., which doesn't only is for the LSP, it's also for a lot of what they call patents or... All right, uh, let's, but let, let's not go uh, this into This is a very specific dis this, yeah. uh, discussion. I wouldn't go uh, into that. <coughs> let's not go into the details, but maybe in general terms. You disagree with the speaker from the audience? Yeah, well, may maybe uh, I'd like to ask you what, what uh, uh, should be, what should happen to make you trust uh, things like that? Or will there never be a situation where you as a, as a, as a general practitioner want to share your data with uh, people in the ambulance or uh, in the hospital or the pharmaceutical, uh, sorry, the, the, the pharmacy? I will tell you exactly, I like to share my, the data of my patients with all these people. I do not want to share the data of my patients and they don't want it with the whole country. And I don't know who gets into these data. As long as it's, it used to be in a smaller area, we had a good system in Amsterdam, all the pharmacists could see which medical. But now it can go all over the world. So there are small So pretend systems. that I'm, I, no. I live in Amsterdam, I'm on holiday in the north of the country, I have a chronic uh, condition, uh, I'm getting a heart attack, uh, uh, I, have, uh, I, uh, I have medication, and uh, uh, there's an ambulance there, or there's a general practitioner, I can't talk anymore. Uh, they don't no, know nothing about me because you don't want to share your data uh, 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 in, in, in the rest of the country. Anyway, this is going to be a discussion. Yeah. That it's more about who can guarantee you safety if you see what happens with banks. I don't know a lot about high, uh, big data, but I know about small data and I see a lot of things going wrong. I also know my own data. They're not always correct. My right. colleagues' data aren't correct either. We send them to national, everybody thinks it's correct. Okay. But that's a nice point, because until now we talked about the technical part of big data, but there's also a behavior uh, part. And I think in the healthcare sector, uh, 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 when, when we want to, to use e-health, when big data will play a, a bigger uh, role, it's very important that medical professionals know how to deal with it and also acknowledge that uh, uh, um, there's a new situation coming up where they need to share uh, things and not keep them for, for, for themselves. Before we go uh, into discussion too long, 
is there a way out of this discussion? Because there will always be a leak in, in systems like this, but there will always be an opportunity for sharing this information that might be helpful. Is there somebody who might be helpful in this particular discussion? Can you, or you have, or somebody else who has not been talking yet from your perspective? Then I will ask you, Alexander, a solution. Something we trust in is, is, is a lot of people trust in is Google or Facebook, right? Google or Facebook. We would not, we would Anybody not in favor? Every day we give them loads of information. So uh, are, are you doing that maybe, the, the GP over there? Aren't you, using, aren't you uploading loads of data to, in your phone? You would that do, the Google or Facebook? Okay, she doesn't. Okay, that's not a solution. You had a solution? <laughs> Sorry, she doesn't. She doesn't put any of her patient's information there. Michiel, would you have a solution? Sorry, I'm, I'm not very well known <laughs> Don't for giving solutions. But um, um, now my question is: Let's say that 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 the patient in in your practice goes to you and she says, or he or she says, please share my data. Please share my data. What will you do then? So the day the, the patients say, share it. I would think that the patients have asked me this in the last... Did you? 3,000 have not asked it. Yes, no, I have not asked oh. that right now. No, she, she hasn't asked the patients. Sir, a short, a short interruption. Yes, I'll try. Um, with regards to um, um, collection of data and cross-access, cross cross I had a patient in our hospital, uh, he's uh, schizophrenic, he had to undergo an eye operation. When, he, when I accompanied him to the hospital, they didn't know he was a psychiatric patient. The surgeon said, I need to have your um, medicine passport from your chemist. So he had to produce that. And of the medicine passport from the chemist stoned his uh, uh, antipsychotica and uh, an ansiolyticum. So b beyond his power, the eye surgeon knew that he was on antipsychotic and uh, sedation medicine. That was probably a good thing, right? Well, yes, that's the discreditable point. Um, it's important for the uh, surgeon to know, of course, the anaesthetist for, for mostly. Uh, so it's a tricky point, but it, the point is he had no choice there. Right. Know, many people who go to hospital before, they wouldn't tell. They wouldn't tell. They just say, "Well, they'll sort it out." But the point is, there was no choice. Okay. So, still, so we have no solution. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, la last. Uh, I don't know how to get to you. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to give you my mi microphone. It's actually about the risks about the data I think it's mostly about hyping it. Mm -hmm. I only heard like the positive sides of it, and there's one. A, a significant concern from a general practitioner and she's kind of being booed away um, by saying obviously you want to share to an international country. I think these concerns are serious and I think we need to discuss them seriously and we do not need to declare privacy as being dead just because <coughs> you share with Google or Facebook what kind of cupcake you ate on this morning. And we're talking about healthcare, so it's, it's significant and it's priv uh, private and it's uh, individual data and we need to have a serious discussion about it because right now I think the level of this discussion is kind of embarrassing, if I may say so. Well, you make a valid point. I think that uh, this point is also coming up from various sides that privacy is important, but thank you for bringing it up once more. Uh, the, the, the issue is, I, I mean, at the moment, I think that data can be shared between more people, you can create efficiencies, and healthcare becomes cheaper. Healthcare is getting more and more expensive all the time at the moment, and we will get to a time that it will be extremely expensive. I wonder, if you ask the Dutch citizens in December, when they have to choose for their new annual healthcare insurance, would you like to have to pay this and this premium per month, or would you like to share your data and pay a lower premium per month? How many people would fill in that box? And I think quite a lot of people would do, and other, and other people would not do it. But why don't we differentiate here? So do you think privacy is only your right to work? No, well, what I'm saying is that you can, uh, you can create efficiencies by sharing data and not having to test your blood five times in different practices, but having the data from one. That will reduce the cost of the healthcare system, which make, keeps health affordable for more people. you make a lot of assumptions that it will bring efficiency gains, and I would like to see you know, some good But isn't the, isn't the assumption that, um, that data might reduce cost for healthcare. 
Aren't there good arguments for that? I thought this round was about all the risks about data collection. I haven't heard a single one from the panel, which is all oh. Excuse me. <laughs> I've been pointing out. I don't, I don't think that is exactly right. I don't think we are sharing the data that gives the cost down. The person who declares that he has more health issues gets higher costs. All right. The insurers, they, and I can speak from the psychiatric point of view, psychiatric patients have high premiums because of their chronic illnesses. So I don't agree with the scientists that sharing the data will bring everybody's premiums down. The people who are healthy and young, they'll go with 10 euros a month. The All right. get older, obesitas, say on payday, their premiums will fly through the roof. Okay, we'll have to break this off for, uh, for this second. We'll go into the third round uh, <laughs> shortly. But thank you very much for your, Sorry, for your contributions. Yeah, you get away with that one. Um, for this, uh, for, uh, to, uh, would you like to react in a closing statement to, for the second round? Uh, I'll just correct. quickly say something. Yeah. I think I've been hearing a lot about insurance but, and the benefits for <coughs> insurance. But I think you also need to appreciate there's a difference between health insurance and risk insurance. And information can be very detrimental to a consumer when it's risk insurance. So premiums can be loaded. Not for this, There's no benefit to the participant or to the consumer. There's only negative implications. <coughs> so sharing information with a risk insurer is actually bad for a consumer. And I think there's also a difference between patients and consumers. And what are you? Are you a patient or are you a consumer? Because there's different governance mechanisms that apply there. The other point that I wanted to make is that I've been hearing a lot about privacy, but I think that there are three different, there are three different aspects to this. One is privacy, one is confidentiality, and one is disclosure. There are three different sides to a prism. So you find that privacy deals with access to information and who gets access to that information. This confidentiality is your duty to protect and not share that information. So nobody's even asking for it. You don't share the information because it's confidential. And disclosure is a mandatory, in some instances, a moral or legal obligation to share information if there's going to be good to others. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, they involve the issue and the notions, they're related notions, but they carry different implications and they're different, they're different uh, factors to take into account there. Thanks for that, nuance. Dianda? I think privacy is a very important issue and uh, uh, we need good regulations. There's a new EU uh, regulations uh, being implemented in 2018 um, uh, uh, which um, gives a lot of obligations to organizations who deal with personal uh, data like privacy by default, privacy by design, as assessments, all kinds of things with big fines when you don't uh, comply. These kind of things are very important. Yes. Thank you very much. May I invite the two other guests, uh, Ruben and Francois, to come forward for the last and final round of the discussion. We now have you all on the stage for the final 10 minutes of the discussion. Ah. Okay. okay. Um, we only have a little bit of time left, but um, the final round is for the future. We have already, of course, dealing with uh, the opportunities for data for healthcare, discussed much of the things that we will see in the near future already today, but more of it in the, in the near and further future. Um, may I maybe uh, ask uh, from the audience uh, to ask um, a future question. Where are we heading? And to put a dilemma to the panel. Who would like to do that? Yes, you. Hello. Um, do you think there's a difference in potential for big data in the public health sector or clinical epidemiology? That's a good question. May I ask uh, Rukutinho to answer that question? Uh, as I said, I think there is a great, great opportunity for, for data uh, to be used for public health purposes. There are probably a lot of answers uh, that can be uh, given. Um, but again, I think you have to ask the question, what exactly do you want to know and what, what do you want to answer? Because in general, it's very difficult to, to answer that question. I find it, I find it very difficult to, to, to say uh, for clinical epidemiology, I think it's a little bit different. But um, again, a good example is genetics. I mean, genetics 
is is uh, we are we are using our drugs uh, very strange. I mean, we're giving the same drugs to everyone, and while we know that certain people have much more advances for certain drugs than others, and so there are huge differences. If you can use that information to personalize medicine, it's it's of course a huge advantage, which we will all profit from. So then you can answer a very important question, which is in the advantage of people. So in each discussion, I think you have to think about what do I want to know and for what purpose do I want to use it? So in general, I find it difficult to say. Yes, the answer is yes, you can use it, but you have to ask specific questions. And, and you need systems. And you need a system, of course. But, but each hospital, each implementation is unique. So it's very difficult to use. Definitely. Well, I think that that's true, but on the other hand, the, the hospitals also have a lot of standardized information which is available. Yes, uh, there's a lot of standardization. I mean, 30 years ago, there was a lot of less standardization. It's much better than before. I'm going to be a bit strict. I, okay. Excuse me. I'm, I am going to be a bit strict now. Okay. Okay. Now, what is the, the next bridge that we will cross, according to you? What uh, decision as a society? Now, uh, there is no global society that takes any decisions, but what is the main issue that we will soon need to resolve when it comes to the dilemma between privacy and quality of data? What is the biggest thing that comes up? So I, I think the two speakers who were talking about the risk um, is about trust, actually, and who do you trust with that data? And I think uh, we need to acknowledge the fact that a lot of that trust has been eroded by th the fact that particularly linked data to individuals has been leaked into the everything from social security numbers to like these ghastly situations where two or three countries have emailed long lists of H you know, patients with their, their HIV status. And I think that we have to, that, that issue of custodianship of, of particularly the linked data has to be paid, more attention needs to be paid to, and we need to hold people far more accountable for that. For that. We can't expect people to participate in the system if they don't trust that, that data is not going to be used in ways that is going to be harmful. Uh, excuse me, um, I would like to go to Jerome. I was just going to say that I think we, know, we need to guard as a society against the normalization of violations because we call it in ethics the slippery slope. Something happens and then something else happens, something else happens, and now we're at the point where five or six years into repeated data violations and data integrity violations, it's almost the norm. So we're not as shocked anymore. So, you know, I think we need to guard against the erosion of privacy and seeing that as normal and accepting it as part of life. I think we need to be very guarded from the word goal and that there needs to be responsible stewardship and responsible custodianship of any data. And if it's going to be put to good use, it needs to be put to public good and public health good rather than for commercialization purposes. But we saw a little bit in the discussion that took part between two sides of the room, it seems a little bit here, that um, a couple of people here seemed to, uh, uh, to think that others in the room did not take uh, the, the whole issue of privacy serious whatsoever. It seems that, what do we do against that? How do we build trust between people that do uh, take their privacy seriously with the, the people that, well, supposedly also do that. I mean, do, you, do you take my point? Well, I, I can, I'm just going to say one second, one thing, and that, you know, I found a, an interesting, just an observation here, that uh, some of my feelings were mirrored by some people in the room in terms of mistrust or apprehension. And it's interesting because the people who seemed to be apprehensive and not trustful were those who have not accepted it as part of normalization. So I'm not on Facebook. And I've clear, very clearly set my privacy settings on different search engines. So you'll find that I'm more guarded about what information I share and what I don't and who I give access to that information, including with my health insurer, I opt out of any sort of sharing on a larger platform. But I think you know what Francois said is correct is that it comes down to trust because I haven't yet been convinced that big data users are going to be using my information responsibly and that they're not doing it for my benefit or for society's benefit, they're doing it for corporate interest. Yes, um, you can react. Yeah. Sorry, uh, this is really a question. I don't want to um, start a discussion because I am not a doctor and I'm very new in this whole field. And I come from a more um, commercial background and um, 
I'm just wondering, I hear also some things about for the public good and or commercial use, but where is the exact, where do you draw the line? Because I can imagine, and again, I don't work in this field, but I can imagine that you might have uh, or an investor or a more commercial uh, company who um, uh, might think or suggest that in some part of the world or a country or whatever, there is a lack of uh, a, a good um, cancer uh, hospital or whatever. And they think if we had the data so that we can see if indeed it's true and we can maybe build, for example, a, 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 a clinic or a facility there, and they might also have commercial purposes like because they will benefit from it or they will maybe even sell their products there, but they are also helping a lot of people perhaps with cancer in that area. So where is that, that, that line for you between public and commercial? Thank you. I, I think it boils down to identifiable data and non-identifiable data. I think commercial purposes, you can collect and mine data and see trends and look at big picture things. But I think as soon as you are able to differentiate who amongst that population is doing what, and you share that information or exploit that information, I think that's where the line gets drawn. So I think that there's a fine line between exploiting information for commercial purposes when there's no individual harm and you, you're looking at patterns, they may be from an ethics perspective, maybe some sort of uh, you know, use for that information and you're not necessarily harming somebody or wronging somebody with that. I think as soon as you start going to an individual level and information is shared about an individual with third parties who are not authorized or not even don't need to know that information, it starts becoming a bit of a problem from a human rights and an ethics perspective as well. Anyone else from the... Well, I, I think the difference is if you want to earn money with it, it's a completely different topic. I mean, it's, 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 it basically it comes back to what you think about pharmaceutical companies. I mean, pharmaceutical companies are extremely important, and we gave them the right to develop drugs. And that's very good, and they're doing a do good job, but they do it to earn money. So if they, if, they, if they look for certain information and they want to use that to earn more money, then the question is, for what purpose do they do, do, they do that? And at the same time, they're doing very, maybe doing something useful. So I find it very difficult. But if, if there is a commercial goal, I would certainly say it's different from a public health goal, very different. I, th I think with, with an increasing uh, role of ICT in the healthcare sector, uh, there's, there's a new group of actors uh, coming up, commercial companies, data companies, the Googles of this uh, world, and where doctors uh, uh, are under strict regulations, these organizations are not. And I think something uh, to that respect has to change. Mm -hmm. François, do you agree? No, I agree. I think that we're living in a very different world and quite dangerous world. And I think that's we, we're still sort of finding our way in terms of what is and isn't needed. I would say the difficulty of opting out. So Jerome and I come from a country where the country subsidizes our health care heavily, even with managed care. And if the government turned around and said, I actually have a right to at least some of your information. I don't want to know it's Jerome's data or Francois's data, but I want to know how many diabetics are actually in this catchment area or how many patients with HIV are actually taking the antiretrovirals in that. I actually have the right to that, to plan appropriately. And I, uh, I'm going to commit resources to that. But that does like, you know, assume a certain level of benevolence. If I want to know who the gay men is, so I can go and arrest them and throw them in prison, that's a completely different thing. And I think that's a, the slightly schizophrenic attitude we have to this whole thing, is that we can see the, pos the, 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 the possibility of good, but we've got tangible um, e examples at the moment of where it's being used for evil. And that's the problem we're having to, to try and straddle both. I would hate to be in a situation where we say, no more big data because it's my information and therefore it won't be released to anybody whatsoever. That really is not, I, I think, is a massive lost opportunity. On the other hand, I think it's naive to think that simply handing over all our data to benevolent big governments and just believing that they're going to do the right thing is, is a good idea. I think that perfectly sums up the evening, and I thank you very much for that, François Fender. Thank you very much. That brings our evening to a conclusion. It is exactly 10 o'clock, so that brings this, brings this perfect evening to an end. I would like to thank the panel for their wonderful contributions. Uh, Dianda Feldman, uh, Rul Coutinho, uh, François Venter, and Jerome Singh. Thank you very much for your contributions, and thank you for being here. And, of course, 
for your questions and for your criticisms and, of course, uh, also for your critical remarks. And I hope to see you again at the next episode of a debate of the Jubelange Institute and the Bali. Thank you very much.